The Trinitarian Beliefs of John of Damascus Introduction The doctrine of, uh, of the Trinity, a central doctrine of the Christian Church, was also one of the main doctrines countered by the early uh, Muslim apologists. It is therefore important to, info to explore early how this doctrine fits with John's overall approach to Islam. What does his explanation and defense of the Trinity reveal about the belief of the belief Christians had at the time? How did others read understand it? Could John of Damascus' apologetic interaction with early Islamic theology have helped mold the way he presented the orthodox doctrine of the Trinity? John's apologetic approach was based on his understanding of orthodox theology. In turn, his writings in both of these areas may have been motivated by the growth of Islamic theology and hegemony. In order to pursue these points, it will be necessary to, fit to first study John of Damascus' understanding of the doctrine of the Trinity. The best place to begin is by examining his most famous book, Orthodox Faith. The Trinitarian Beliefs of John of Damascus John of Damascus' Orthodox Faith is the first part of his larger work, The Fount of Knowledge, P.G. Genesios, which was written around AD 743. It contains 100 chapters divided into four books. The, the first book deals with God in unity and trinity. The second book deals with God's creation. The third book focuses on Christology. And the fourth book discuss, discusses a number of theological issues such as with baptism, the caris and the resurrection. The topic seems to follow the order of the Nican Creed. Though John placed the discussion of the Holy Spirit in with the Trinity, and he did not deal with the church and he did not deal with the church at all. John borrowed material from many writers, especially Greek theologians, such as the three chap the, the three Cappadocians, Gregory of Nazianzus. Gregory of Nyssa and Basil the Great, to such an extent that some critics have faulted him for merely compiling ideas taken from others. However, Frederick Chase suggests that John had the genius for selecting appropriate material and that he was a master of synthesis rather than of mere compilation. At one piece, Chase writes that the whole is a surprisingly successful synthesis of traditional Catholic teaching as handed down by the Greek fathers and the ecumenical councils. Chess also adds that there is nothing new or original in the matter of doctrine, but there is something original in the treatment and, and the clarity of this treatment. In chapter one of what in chapter one of book one of the Orthodox Faith, John follows the example of Gregory Nazianzen, as well as the word of the Apostle John, John chapter 1, verse 18, in proclaiming that ultimately God is ineffable and incomprehensible, and therefore what is said about his nature is to revelation by the Son, the Son and the creation. This knowledge is then passed down to us through the traditions in the Old Testament, the Law and the Prophets, and then to the New Testament, especially to His only begotten Son, our Lord and God and Savior Jesus Christ. This appeal to what can be known about the nature of God and what cannot be known about the mysterious Trinity had to learn various ways of distinguishing God's nature from his activities or what he is not in contrast in contrast to what he is. This latter distinction categorizes 
de apophatic 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 apophaticos or negative terms in contradiction in cat or or negative terms in contradiction contradistinction to the cataphatic cataphaticos or positive words used in relation to God. Thus the apophatic terms using alpha primitive form in Greek are not will not rep, not will be represented by not finite, not created, not begotten, and will be and will seek to reveal what God is not while in while the cataphatic terms would relate what he is makers of all things, provider of all and ruling over all. Andrew Lute also points out another important distinction between the concept between the concepts theologia and economia. Between knowledge of God in himself, which principally entails recognition of the divine being, including the mystery of the Trinity, and knowledge of God's revelation of himself to the through the economia, his activity with regard to humankind the humankind in and through creation, including his presence among us in the incarnation. This distinction corresponds largely to the distinction between God's unknowable being and his activity or energy through which he makes himself known. In chapter 2, John elaborates on his view of the economia in order to demonstrate that there are some things about the Godhead that are capable of being expressed and there are also some things that can be known especially to revelation to the scriptures and to the word the Logos the Son of God. He cautions the reader that even, we, that even when we use words to describe God's nature, we need to be careful because God is beyond any words. Thus, when we engage language to describe the ineffable, we go from the familiar to the far and familiar, and then on to the transcendent. So, while we may, in speaking about God, tribute to Him sleep, anger, indifference, hands and feet, and they alike, we need to realize, we need to realize that He is far beyond these human assassinations. It is because God's nature is ultimately beyond the ability of man to capture his essence in words that often when we speak about God, we use the prophetic or negative form. John gives several instances of these terms referring to God, such as without beginning and without end, everlasting and eternal, uncreated, unchangeable, uh, in it in a He then balances the, neg the negative with the positive, the maker of all created things, all powerful, all ruling, all seeing, the provider, the sovereign, and the judge of all. He lists these divine attributes at the beginning of a type of doctrinal confession as a way, perhaps, of linking his Summa Theologica with the Christ of the Church and the theology of the Church Fathers who proceeds who preceded him. After he list of divine attributes, John confesses that God is one, that is to say, one substance Iusia, and that he is both understood to be and is and is in three persons hypothesis i mean the father the son and holy spirit it is significant that john uses the word usia and hypostasis not only because of the use confirms his orthodox link to the church and the church fathers but also because as the summarizer of orthodox faith. He is able to establish these terms as the way that the church in the future will refer to the one God in three persons. It is also significant that in the midst of stating that God is ultimately ineffable and that if we use words to, to try to describe his nature, they must either show what he is what he is not or else they can only be used as in the great reference, reference to something far greater. John establishes the words usia and hypostasis as foundational words in describing the relationship between the one and the three. Of course, the two words themselves are the product of hundreds of years. 
of refinement by both Western and Eastern theologians and are borrowed, more, and are borrowed most heavily from the Cappadocians, but they still represent men's best, best attempt to capture the essence of the relationship that John continually claims is unknown and beyond all understanding. Indeed, John says that it is because we do not know what, it, what the substance of God is or how it is on all things. Then, we must be careful with our choice of words and make sure that what we are certain about God does not go beyond what has been defined and proclaimed to us, whether taught or, re or, re or revealed by the this, by this sacred declarations of the Old and the New Testaments. Thus, even the words that are used must conform to the parameters set in God's revealed nature to scripture and the created world and the created world in chapter three john is concerned with demonstrating the existence of god not to some elaborate philosophical argument but rather to the testimony of those who have accepted his existence such as the writers of the old and new testaments most of the greeks and also by those who acknowledge god's existence to the testimony of nature he also says that the apostles to the power of God and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit not only gave testimony to the existence of God but broke enlightenment to all those who listened. He then credits the early shepherds and teachers with, the, with further enlightenment to the grace of the Spirit and the confession of those who were once in error. It is interesting to note that John apparently does not feel worthy enough to be counted as part of that great company as one who has not received the gifts of miracles and the teach and teaching but he does not but he does not hope that with the aid of the father son and holy spirit he will be able to discuss some of the some of the wisdom handed down from the apostles and teachers john then goes on to deal with the distinction between all things that created and, and uncreated which adam luth claims had become the fundamental ontological distinction for Christian metaphysics. The argument is based on the distinction that created beings, men, angels, etc., men, angels, etc., were changeable and uncreated beings, the three persons of the Trinity, were not changeable against change by free choice, either positively in a more God-like manner or negatively in a more corrupt manner. As a result, all changeable things must be created. Perhaps a simple syllogism will help illustrate the difference. 1. Only created things are changeable. 2. Man is changeable. 3. Man is created. On the hand, 1. All created things are changeable. 2. God is not, ch God is not changeable. Therefore, 3. Therefore, God is uncreated. Also, if God had been created, someone else would have had to have created him, and so on until we get to the uncreated being, which is an ontological necessity. necessity. Even in today's world, we understand through the first law of thermodynamics that the world of physical matter had to have a beginning and a source greater than itself, something could come from nothing but rather it has to come from something or somewhere greater, greater than or an eternal. The created universe like all created things is an effect and therefore requires a, a cause to bring it into existence. God on the, on the other hand is not an effect and therefore does not need a cause to bring him into existence. Rather God is the uncaused cause who brings and all, who brings all things or effects into existence. Moreover, John, to a series of questions regarding the formation of heavens and the earth, postulates that there must have been an architect 
who not only formed them from biomaterial but also brought them into being into existence. He also reasons that it could not have occurred spontaneously or by chance for the very harmony of creation speaks about the design that is apparent and requires a designer or supreme architect better known as God. In chapter 4 John deals with the nature of God, especially that he is without a body, for how for how could a body contain that which is limitless, boundless, formless, impalpable, invisible, simple and uncompounded? It is important to note that God is without a body, but Christ to the incarnation of the activity of the economia has to have a body that fully identifies him as human. Yet he is also fully God, only by having to natus can Christ be fully identified with God who has no body and does not change, and also fully with man who has also who has a body and is subject to change. At this point John focuses on the immutability of God because he wants to emphasize that we change games with change comes conflict, and conflict is the cause of separation, and separation the cause of dissolution, but dissolution is altogether forgotten to God. Since God is uncreated and unchangeable, He cannot be subject to change which ultimately brings dissolution of a body. On the contrary, it is because God is transcendent over all created beings and not contained in a body that He can be the prime mover of all things. Only the divinity is unmoved and by His immovability He moves all things. Again, the reason that this is important is that anything that can be made to move by another is subject to change and therefore less than perfect. By necessity, there must be a starting point. A immovable being who moves everything that, that is moved. However, since that which is immovable cannot be locally contained, he also he can be contained in a body. This argument is another instance in which John is making the point that in regard to God's essence, which is unbegotten, without beginning, immutable, and incorruptible, is it is much easier to explain what God is not rather than what He is. It is very difficult to discuss God's nature because He transcends all created nature with which we are familiar. In fact, as John explains, He transcends all beings and being itself. Because of this, ultimately God's true nature is limitless and incomprehensible, and incomprehensibility is all that can be understood above him about him. Therefore, we are not able to describe his true nature, but only what relates to his nature, such as his attributes. In chapter 5, John establishes the unity of God. This is important in, in that it will lay the groundwork for the next sections which seek to establish the distinctions of the three persons of the one God. Although John seems to rely on Gregory of Nyssa's great catechical oration, especially his prologue and chapters 1 until 4, John's biblical exegesis established the unity of God based primarily on the Old Testament, and some on the New Testament, Testament seem to be his own emphasis. Perhaps, John wanted to contrast the biblical view in order to show, Jesus, to show Jews and especially Muslims that Christians worship one God who also, appear, who also happens to be triune, since both Jews and Muslims worship only one God. John may be consciously trying to build a bridge from a common belief to a distinctive belief in the Trinity to the development of this idea of God's unity especially from a scriptural standpoint. After John reminds the reader of the incomprehensible nature of God, he has said that a believer would accept the prem this premise and still understood God to be one and not several. He supports this unity by establishing that both the Old Testament and the New Testament are from belief in one God. 
he first quotes from Exodus chapter 20, verse 2 and 3, the Ten Commandments, and Deuteronomy chapter, chapter 4, verse 4. Chapter 6, verse 4, the Shema, Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Chad. In one of here of Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. In order to show that the law of God establishes belief in one God. This is followed by Isaiah chapter 43, verse 10. Before me there was no God, and after me there shall be none, and beside me there is none. Which affirms this view of God's unity among the prophets. Then he uses John chapter four, chapter 17, verse 3. This is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only true God. In order to let the apostle represent the testimony of the Gospels and the early church believe in one God, John then goes on to John then go, John then goes on to establish the logical nature of one God in opposition to several gods by stating that the one God has to be perfect and without deficiency. For it there, for if there were several gods with differences between them, then they would be incomplete and therefore less than perfect. But the one God must be perfect in order to be the only God, for where there is there is one there cannot be another. Now John is ready to show that this one God is also found in three persons who exist in such a way that there are still one God, inseparable, separate, inseparably separate, a unity within our community. In chapter 6, John follows Gregory of Nyssa's prologue in his catechetical catechic, catech, discourse, and he concentrates on the word of God. Not only is the one God, chapter 5, but the word of God, the Logos, is identical with God. Continuing with the idea that in the perfection of God, there is a unity, John, now John now shows that in that unity, there is a subsistent word of Logos that is distinct from the one in whom he has his subsistence. He was compared the non-subsistence and post Anipostatos, word of human, which is derived from the mind, with the word of God or Logos, which must be subsistent, anipostatos, in order to be a separate hypostasis, which generates the from the Father, but always is distinct from him from whom he has his subsistence. The significance of the analogy, which others, like Augustine used, is to show that in the in human speech is first derived from a thought in the mind and therefore shares the nature of essence that or, of or sense of that thought but then the words are spoken and dissipate in the air and so are gone while the mind remains the words the words do not and are therefore non, non subsistent or not subsistent in themselves in regard to the eternal logos while he is generated from the father he does not pass out from him but always remains within him However, the Logos is fully distinct from the Father and yet has his subsistence with the Father. In fact, he fully sects it in the essence of the Father. The only way that this can be explained is that the unity of the one God must exist in more than one hypostasis and yet remain perfect in his unity. Therefore, just as perfection is found in the chapter, it is also found in the word Chapter 7 John extends his analogy to include the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Like the word, the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit also is subsistent in the Godhead, but also fully God in his own in his unhypostatic relationship. John begins by stating that just as human just as humans need, need breath in order to express a word that originates in the mind, the word must also have a spirit benevma. The analogy falls short, however, because the breath of the of the human is not of the of the sub, sub, same substance as the mind that originates the thought or the word that expresses the thought, but rather the breath comes from outside of the body and is used to give vocalization to the word. In the Godhead, just as the word has its own subsistence in the unity, 
the spirit serves the same usia and yet has his own subsistence subsistence in his in himself just like the world the spirit then should also be conceived of us substantially subsisting endowed with will and operation and all powerful with what we must in this chapter is a summary of Gregory of Nyssa explanation John as an interesting phrase that indicates a more precise understanding of the position of the spirit in relation to the son John says that the spirit proceeds from the father coming to rest in the world and declaring him not separated from God in a sense or from the world with whom it is associated. John will develop this thought further in chapter 8, but intimates a far deeper theme that will develop more fully in this concept of the precoresis of God, in which three persons of the one God merge mystically within each other. Regarding this relationship, Robert Latham explained that explains that indeed the Holy Spirit has the same order and nature toward the Son as the Son as toward the Father. The Son is in the Father, and the Father is in the Son, and so also is the Holy Spirit in the Son, and the Son in the Holy Spirit. Thus, the Spirit cannot be divided from the world. So also the Spirit is in God, the Father, and from the Father. As the Son, as the Son comes in the name of the Father, so the Holy Spirit comes in the name of the Son. There is one efficacy and action of the Holy Trinity, for the Father's, for the, for the Father makes all things true. The word by the Holy Spirit. Also, when Gregory used the word and hypostatos, John incorporates the word and hypostatos or in exist. What he means by this is that the Holy Spirit, like the word, proceeds from the Father and yet still exists in union with Him. In regard to this concept of in existence, Kirill of Alexandria adds that the Spirit is from the, be from the being of the Son as He is from the being of the Father in such a way that the Spirit can be said to not only be sent from the Father to the Son but also that He proceeds from the Father and the Son. John does not go quite as far as Kirill in his pericoretical perico concept of the Trinity for John will not say that the Spirit could not proceed from the Father and the Son. However, if the 9th century church understood his concept and hypostatos, or in existence, or the fuller development of the inheritance of the three persons of the one God, developed in the concept of pericoresis, then perhaps they would not have been divided over the filioque controversy. In the next part of chapter 7, John seems to return to Gregory catechetical, catechetical oration in order to confirm the narrow monotheism of Judaism and the polytheism of paganism while the transcend view of Christian Trinitarianism. For John, this triune monotheism transforms the two heresies by taking the positive Jewish, Jewish view of the one nature of God and synthesizing it with the positive view of Greek teaching of the unique distinction of, hypost of the hypostasis in order to develop the transcendent view of the triune God who exists eternally in the form of another in three persons, hypostasis. In, in his concession to the beliefs of the Jews and the Greeks, John may have developed his presentation of the Trinity by the Trinity of the theology of the Trinity by using the word and the spirit concepts that would be understandable to his audience. However, John may thinking he has much John may, John may thinking much more directly about the Muslims who on the one hand denounce the Trinity and the deity of Christ, but on the other hand, recognize that Allah possesses both God and Spirit. Perhaps what prompted John to begin his Orthodox faith with an explanation of the Trinity, focusing on the Word and the Spirit, was the realization of Islam, was the realization of Islam with its strong denunciation of anyone who would associate with a man with God 
and its Baharan denial of a Trian God would at least agree on the terms of their disagreement. In other words, perhaps John was specifically and secretly addressing some of the main concerns that the Muslims had in the rejection of Christianity. To be sure, Later, Christian apologists like Theodore Abukuro extensively used the argument of the word and the spirit of Allah in the Quran in order to present what they considered to be the superior nature of Christian doctrine and beliefs. John's summative treatment of the theology of the early Christian of the of the earlier church fathers, especially the Cappadocians, would have served this later apologetic cause well. Chapter 8 is the longest part. Is the longest chapter in the Orthodox faith and one of the most important chapters concerning the doctrine of the Trinity. Interlude divides the chapter into four sections. Session 1 deals with a restatement of the belief in one God who is ineffable and transcendent, as well as the relationship between the Father and the Son, especially in regard to the difference between begetting or generation and creation. Session 2 evokes. Session 2 explores the differences between the nature of divine generation and possession as well as the differences between uh, agenitos or unbegotten or agenitos and originated or, un or uncreated. In Session 3, John explores the nature of the procreation of the Holy Spirit and the relationship between the Holy Spirit and the Son. Then in Section 4, John introduces the term prerogatives co-inheritance for the first time and develops the concepts, the concept of the nature of the divine unity. In the first section of chapter 8, John begins by clearly stating that Christians believe in one God. Again, this relates back to the Old Testament teaching of one God as well as to the foundation for the three persons so carefully described in the New Testament. In order to emphasize the nature of the one God, John begins to list a number of divine attributes that set the one God apart from his creation. There are four groups of attributes. The first group describes what God is not using the alpha primitive using the alpha privative, privative, privative form, such as we thought beginning anachron, uncreated actiston, and begotten agenitron. Since God in favor, it is hard to find words that can adequately describe his attributes. In the second group, John uses words that show what God is through, the, through a description of his actions, such as maker, of all things, provider of all, and ruling over all. His use of the bandon especially emphasizes the extent of God's rule over everything. The third, the third group of phrases describes how God is beyond all things that are conceived, such as supersubstantial and surpassing all, to the degree that God is above essence and life and speech and concept. These phrases indicate that God is unlike anything in the world of man, which is an important distinction to make before he goes on to deal with the nature of the Godhead. The fourth group of divine attributes begins this transition in its reference to the oneness of God's nature, one substance, one Godhead, one future, one will, one kingdom. John then concludes this list with a type of confession that states that this one God with all these attributes is known in the three in the in three perfect persons united without confusion and distinct without separation, which is beyond understanding. John will later develop this sense of God's intermingling of the one and the three in his in his concept of the precoresis or the cycle dance of God's three nature. John often cautions the reader that the true essence of God is beyond understanding, but his pericoretic model of the Trinity seeks to give shape to the ineffable by describing the relationship of the three persons of the one God. Most men captures John's description of the circulatory character of the eternal divine life. 
when he writes that in the Pericoresis, the very thing that divides them becomes that which binds them together. The circulation of the eternal divine life becomes perfect to the fellowship and unity of the three different persons in the eternal life. This image of interpretation, interpen interpenetration without confusion is developed in more detail later, later on as is the concept that God, that the Godhead is somehow always in motion as in a dance, but a dance of beginning, proceeding, and yet remaining unbegotten. John then continues with a reference to how these three persons, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, could all be involved together in the act of baptism, a moving of the one God to the life of the believer. As John continues the confession, he begins to describe the relationship of the three, of the three persons. The Father, who is uncaused and unbegotten, is also the principal cause of all things. The Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, was begotten of the Father, and the Father is also called the emitter of the Holy Spirit. John uses a number of phrases from the Nikeno Constantinople Creed, such as like from like to God from to God, begotten, not made consubstantial with the Father. It is possible that John links back to the established creed in order to give greater acceptance to his development of the relationship of the three persons. For John, the essential relationship between the Father and the Son is that the Father has begotten the Son without bringing about any change in the Father or the Son. If there, if there were any change, for example, if the Son were brought from nothing into being, then his begetting would not, would not be on sight of time and without a beginning. This would mean, among other things, that before the Son that before the Son came into being, then the Father would have been a Father. This would then imply that, cha that a change in status had and had taken place. Once a Father, once not a Father, and then after begetting the Son become a Father, and in this and this in turn would indicate that God is not perfect because any change in His nature would indicate imperfection. This is what Arius implied when he said that. There was once when there was once when the Son was not. Not only would this strip Jesus of his deity, but it would also strip fatherhood from God. Therefore, John had to emphasize that the Son was not brought from nothing into being, but rather he was always with the Father, being begotten of him it being begotten of him eternally and without being. Also the Father and the Son begotten of him exist together simultaneously so that the father has always been the father and the son has always been begotten as the son otherwise we would be introducing a change a change into the substance of the father and that would put him on the same status as a created being in need of some other god for his for his existence therefore the father has always been the father and the Son has always been the Son. Even more, the Father is always begetting the Son, and the Son is always being begotten. Otherwise, this would also indicate a change in their status, and a limitation to the nature of God. Neither does His unfathomable being having being have begetting, have beginning or end. It is without beginning, because He is immutable. On the other hand, Creation is the sight of God, and was broke from nothing into being by His will and power. Also, since it is not of the substance, substance of God, it does not involve any change in the other, in the nature of God. Therefore, creation has a beginning point in time, and it is subject to change. Jesus Christ the Son could never have been a created being, or He too would have had a beginning to His existence, and a change in His nature from non-existence to existence, and therefore he could not be deity. Thus, John destroys the argument of Arius and emphasizes that Jesus, the eternal Son, has always excited, has always ex existed with the Father. However, it is likely that John had in mind the Muslim belief that Jesus is not the Son of God and therefore not divine, rather than the warning heresy of Arius. 
having lived and walked under the under the heresy of the Ismailites, it seems like John would have been keen to provide a counter to the false be beliefs. In the, in the next section, John develops the narrative of divine regeneration and procession, especially in the relationship of the Father and the Son. He makes references to the teachings of the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church in a similar manner to his earlier use of a clear structure in order to maintain the sense that his views flows out that his views flow out of the church it creates and the scripture upon which, upon which both the church and the creeds were founded. The link to authority is an important step in establishing the subsequent authority of his own teaching, especially if he had his systemic counterparts in mind. In the relationship of the father and son, John echoes the Cappadocians when he says that in all things the son is that the father is set in the father's being unbegotten. So the father and son exist, exist simultaneously together without time or change of passion. In relation to the set nature, but they are still separate in that the father is unbegotten while the son is eternally begotten of the father. John then attempts to illustrate what he acknowledges is in a manner beyond understanding. Through the use of analogy, Concerning fire and the light that is produced, light and the fire exist simultaneously, and just and just as the light is ever being begotten, or the fire is always in it and is no way separated from it, so also is the Son begotten of the Father, without in any way being separated from Him, but always existing in Him. The main difference, of course, is that the light has no existence outside of the fire, and both are of a created and changeable order, while the Son does have his own individual existence apart from that of the Father. The important distinction that John is making that John is making is that when we understand the fullness of the distinction of the Son's beginning, we will better understand the narrative of the Godhead. In order to clarify the distinction of beginning, John emphasizes the point that the Holy Spirit is not begotten of the Father, but rather proceeds from the Father. It may be important to note that John consistently refers to the procession of the Holy Spirit as from the Father only. The Holy Spirit may proceed through the Son and be found in the Son, but the procession of the Holy Spirit only takes place from the Father. In fact, John likes to refer to the three persons hypostasis as the begotten Father the begotten Son, and the one who possesses Holy Spirit. Since the terms unbegotten and unbegotten can also be used of created man, John explains that there is an important distinction in the use of these terms while Adam was unbegotten, since he was created by God of an human substance. If and if was also unbegotten, since he was created from a part of Adam and not through begetting the sunset was begotten since he was the product of his parents. Through though all they though all three were brought into existence through different means they were still of of the same human nature and therefore consubstantial, and though they all came into existence differently, they were different, different only in the manner of their existence. Thus, with human, with thus, with humans, they can be consubstantial and differ only in their modes of existence. However, there is a crucial distinction between the manner of created existence and that of the Trinity. John employs the use of the two of two Greek words to explain the distinction Aginiton and Aginiton with the double nu. The former means the former means that which has not been created and therefore can be applied to all three persons of the Trinity since they are uncreated of the same substance. This use, this use of the term cannot, however, be applied to humans, 
since the, the since there was a time when they were created and came into existence. The first term aginiton also indicates that the sense the sense of the existence the essence of the Godhead is different from that of created beings since the former has no origin and the latter is created or originated. In fact, the application can only be made in reverence to God since all things or effects had their cause in the God, the only uncaused cause. On the other hand, the word Aginiton means that which has no ha which has not been begotten, while this term in reference to creatures does imply any re reference in essence, there is an important distinction distinction in reference to the father in a technical sense, all created things work unbegotten, but only because God first created them uniquely thereafter they were begotten of the same nature of essence. In regard to the Father, however, He is the same substance usia of the Son, but the Father alone is unbegotten in so far as He does not have His being from another person. Therefore, the Father is unoriginate and unbegotten. While the Son may also be unoriginate without, being, without beginning and independent of time, the Son is begotten of the substance of the Father. The problem here is that if, be, if begotten refers to a time when something did not exist as which created beings, how could the Son still unoriginate with the Father while being begotten of Him, since the implication of the Father's unbegotten state is that He does not have His being from another person. His Son, however, does have his being from another person, the Father. In order to demonstrate that while the Son is begotten, he is also unoriginate, and therefore different in his essence that created in his essence than created big things, John appeals to scripture to the concept of causality and to the analogy of the fire, after reminding his readers that ultimately the concept of begetting in reference to, God, to the God is beyond understanding. He also reminds them that the term paternity, sonship, and procession were handed down to us from scripture. He then attempts to settle the issue by an appeal to causality in reference to created things. There is a cause who brings them into existence and therefore there is a change in their status from non-being to being. However, in this case, the son, there was never a time when he was not, for that would indicate a change in his being and therefore a refutation of his deity status. Thus, the son has to be begotten or the substance of the father without beginning and independently of time. This means that the father does not come before son, before the son either in time or in nature. But rather than the Father is naturally the cause of the Son, in that the Son is begotten of the Father and not the Father of the Son. The Father caused the Son, not the, not the other around, much like the light from the fire is caused by the fire which is, it, which is its source. The Father is source of the Son, but unlike the fire and the light of in analogy, since the light is only a natural property of the fire and does not have a separated hypostasis from the fire, but the sun has a separate hypostasis he, while sharing the same substance usia with the father. Moreover, in this relationship, the father does all things whatsoever to his only begotten son as to a natural and distinctly subsistent force. This description of the relationship with each is in each sense. The son in a perfect individual substance is separable from that of the father, alludes again to the pericoretical nature of the father and the son, in that there is constant movement in the father eternally begetting the son, who is eternally expressing the nature of the father. 
There is, of course, a third person in this relationship, the Holy Spirit, and John now moves on to developing the one who proceeds from the Father. And Rudolf comments that in the third section in chapter 8, John brings together refinements in the, un in the understanding of the position of the Holy Spirit that have been determined for the later Orthodox theology. Similar concepts, Luth continues, can be found in Athanasius and Didymus, especially in the way the Spirit abides in the Son, but John takes the concept further and speaks of an eternal resting of the Spirit in the, in the Son manifested in the Economia, when the Spirit rests or abides on the, on the Son. Spirit, similarly, the Spirit, similarly, the Spirit, with, similar with the Spirit is the manifestation of the Son, this takes place in the Economia, but it depends on the eternal self-manifestation of the Son in the Spirit. This concept of the Spirit abiding on the Son and the Son in the Spirit as the Father is in the Son gives us a richer description of the Pericoritical relationship. The mutual indwelling of the Father and Son is extended so as to include the Holy Spirit in the same coherence with the other hypostasis. Early John presents the Holy Spirit as the companion of the Word, the one who makes the Word manifest. A little further on, John presents the Holy Spirit as the bond between the first and second persons. He is the median of the unbegotten and the begotten, Father and Son, and he is joined with the Father to the Son. There is a, there is a unity in the communion. In the, co in the community that has no beginning and no end, just like a circle in this circle dance of the one God who is there. In this section, John against you the largest the structure of a creed in order to legitimize the introduction of the Holy Spirit as fully God and as one who is adored and glorified together with the Father and Son as consubstantial and co-eternal with them. In regard to the Father, John has developed the idea of the hypostasis who is uncreated and unbegotten. In regard to the Son, John has explored the concept of the hypothesis, hypostasis, who is uncreated and eternally begotten. Now he turns to the hypothesis who is uncreated and proceeds eternally from the Father to the Son. The propositions are extremely important in all these cases for the filioque controversy, which John seems to be unaware of a time of at this time, was based on the belief that the Holy Spirit proceed, proceeded from both the Father and the Son. John, on the other hand, is very careful to portray the possession of the Holy Spirit as coming from the Father only, who is the source, then from both then for both the Holy Spirit and the Son. If the Holy Spirit also proceeds from the Son, then how could there only be one source? John does seem be to, John does seem to be aware of this problem, and therefore emphasizes that while the Holy Spirit abides in the abides in the Son and is communicated to the Son, His possession comes from the Father only, like the Son. For the Holy Spirit is distinctly subsistence. Subsi is distinctly the subsistent and exists in his own person and has everything the Father and Son have, ex have except the being unbegotten and the, and the being begotten. Thus, whatsoever the Son has from the Father, the Spirit also has, including his very being. In this relationship, therefore, the only essential difference between, three per between the three persons is that the Father is unbegotten the Son is eternally begotten, and the Holy Spirit eternally proceeds. Although John admits that it is beyond comprehensi comprehension to truly understand these differences, he does concede that this, there must be one simple essence, evidently and antecedently perfect in three persons without being compounded, since that would make them imperfect. The only way this unity within, within a community could exist is for the three persons to, to exist in one another, uncompounded and without confusion. 
otherwise there would not be the eternal motion that is the still point of the, the turning world the unbegotten father eternally begotting the son to whom the holy spirit is being uh, communicated to the world who is turned forces from the father and glorifies the son and together both the son and the holy spirit bring glory to the father as the three are one and the one god is three in a unity of community that is the dance the perichoresis the motion the motion that never ceases that never ceases and yet is in all as each person is one in another and still there is only one for as john concludes john god and his word and his spirit are really one god the trinity in heresy of the Ismailites. in this section john's explanation of the trinity in his theological masterpiece orthodox faith will be compared to his treatment of the trinity in his polemical works on islam the main question to be answered are first did his theological works develop from his apologetic works or what is was it the reverse second is it possible that both formats work dialectically to express and develop each other third could islam have acted to motivate john to write his theological works as well as his apologetic treatise in this main treatise against islam heresy of this marriage john addressed the saracen's denial of the divinity of christ and their absolute rejection of the triune of god the follower of muhammad considered belief in a trinity to be the greatest of all blasphemies since in their view in uh, since the in the view it associated a created being with the eternal god they called this sin shirk and those who associated another god another with god were called mushrikun for example the quran the quran states in fa, in five chapter 72 and 73 that they do blaspheme who say allah is the christ the son of mary whoever whoever joins together gods with allah allah will forbid him in the, gar the garden and the fire will be his abode they do blaspheme who say allah is one of the three of three in the trinity there is no god except one god also in surah 9 chapter 31 we find that the Ismailites called were commanded to worship but one allah there is no god but he praise and glory to him far is he for having the partners they associate with him however the Quran also acknowledges that jesus christ is so is known as both the word of god and the spirit of god in surah chapter in surah 4 chapter 171 we find the words all people of the book commit no sexes in your religion no say allah out but the truth christ jesus the son of mary was more than a messenger of allah and his word which he bestowed on mary and the spirit proceeding from him so believe in allah and his messengers say not trinity this is it will be better for you it will be better for you for allah is one god these verses are found in portions of the Quran with which John seems to have been familiar and in his response John acknowledged that this malice accepted Jesus Christ as God's word and spirit. Then he then raises a very important question. Since you also say that Christ is word and spirit of God, why do you accuse us of being associators? As John has so meticulously, meticulously explained in his orthodox faith he also argued in his treatise against the Ismailites that god's that god's word and spirit must be inspired from god moreover if god's word and spirit are outside of god as the Ismailites seem to imply then god must be without his word and spirit and therefore according to john mutilated or torn apart Thus, while the Saracens accuse Christian of being associated with Musikun because they associated Christ with God, John accused the Saracens of being mutilators, Koptas, 
of God because they reap God, God's spirit and what away from him. This argument become one of the most popular ones developed by John and was used for centuries as Christians confronted Muslims in the defense of the Trinity. Perhaps the reason of the success of John's argument is that it is based on his foundational theological explanations of the nature and growth of the three persons of the Trinity in his Orthodox speech. This raises a very important question. Could John have written, in, have written his Orthodox faith as a defense of the faith in light of the hegemony of Islam? Is it possible that the development of John's apologetic approach was based on his understanding of Orthodox theology and that his doctrinal explanation developed as a response to the misunderstandings of the belief systems surrounding Islam, surrounding, surrounding John like Islam? Luth remains as that Christological doctrine did not develop on its own but as a response to a series of misunderstandings of what faith in Christ entailed. If this occurred in, his, in relation to Christological misunderstandings, surely it would have, be, it would have been preserved in regard to Trinity, Trinitarian ones. This certainly seems to be the to be case when we examine John's polemical writings in Orthodox faith. John takes great care to show that it was necessary that the word has al had always existed in the Godhead for three, for there never was a time when God the word was not. Also, unlike human speech, when dissipates in the air, the word of God is always subsistent, always existing in him. John makes it clear that the word could not be outside of God, but but since the word is always begotten of the Father, he must be always existing, living, perfect, distinctly subsisted, and having all things that he speaketh to us. Thus, the argument found in John's heresy seems to be reflected in Octonox faith, and the theological underpinning of the argument in heresy is more developed in Octonox faith, they work in tandem with, it, with each other. We also see this same argument developed in just disputation between a Christian and a Saracen. The Trinity, the Trinity in disputation between a Christian and a Saracen. In his treatise, the disputation between a Christian and a Saracen, John also raises the issue of Jesus being the Word and Spirit of God. I will ask you this. Before God created the Spirit and the Word, did He have neither Spirit nor Word? This is the same issue He has he raised in heresy and in Orthodox faith, explaining that God is not without the Word, and there never was a time when God the Word was not. A little word in his disputation, when John is explaining the two natures of Christ, he writes that the eternal Word of God is one, for indeed a fourth person has not been added to the to the Trinity. This reference to a fourth person of the Trinity is also mentioned in Doctor of Faith when John writes his two natures belong to the one person and the one subsistence of the Word of God. Thus I do not add a fourth person to the Trinity. God forbid hands in both John's Orthodox faith and his dispatch reference to the word as a fourth person is vehemently denied. These close comparisons found in different works by John provide strong evidence for the interdevelopmental production of these ideas. We may say that one source, perhaps his theological writings, provided the foundation for his apologetic works, or perhaps his apologetic works were later refined and developed in his theological works or perhaps they interacted with each other as a different expressions for the same ideas. It is also feasible to infer that the theological, con the theological controversies that inspired John to pen his polemical treatise against Islam could also have served as a catalyst for his polemical works on such similar subjects as the Jacobin faction or Manichaeanism. Even though Orthodox Christians has remonstrated for centuries 
before John concerning what they considered to be errors in the belief systems of Jacobites and Manichaeans. The greater freedom and God desires his under Islam rule may have prompted John to not to not only re-engage with them poly polemically, but also use them as proxy arguments against Islam. Thus, the common background to these works may have been the God of Islam as he began to dominate both John's religious and political worlds. For example, in his criticism by the of the Byzantine Church, Kenneth Scott, Kenneth Scott Latourette suggested that the one of characteristics of the time of John Damascus was the growing st sterility in theological thought. According to some scholars, even John seemed to have little to add to the to theological thought other than to summarize the orthodox views of his predecessors. As for, as for the cause of this sterility, Latourette suggested it may have been a result of the Byzantine realms defensive posture against encroaching fathers from the Persian Empire and subsequently from the Arab world. In John's works, we can certainly trace these defensive themes in his specific writings against Islam. Is it possible that his studies against, against the iconoclasts, Manichaeans, monophysites, and historians, as well as his popular treatise on doctrine, the fountain of knowledge, were also written in response in response to the God of Islamic theology and hegemony. If this is the case, then we should notice the same themes and arguments in both his treatise against Islam as well as his writings against the pervading, pervading Christian heresies of his day. We should also find these common elements addressed in his doctrinal writings such as his orthodox faith, since his theology should form the foundation of his apologetics. If a pattern is present linking these works together, then it is feasible to postulate that his common desire was to instruct Christians in the fundamentals of the Christian Christian faith in order to defend their beliefs against the retractors and refute error. The Byzantines were too far away, the Manichaeans were too weak, and the Christological heresies were no more than nations. The real challenger was the continuing God and dominance of Islam. Could this situation have met this view on every horizon and prompted his words in his apologetic writings? Let us examine some of these arguments in order to determine the extent to which this view can, can be supported. Iconoclasm, Leo the Third, the Byzantine Ego, the Byzantine Emperor issued an edict in 726 banning the veneration of Christian icons in place of, in place of worship. John responded strongly against Leo's edict in his three treatises on the divine images. John argued that the incarnation of Christ provided a visible form of worship of the invisible God. Therefore, the veneration of icons which focused on a which focus a worshippers' adoration on the person of Christ should be considered a viable form of worship in the church. It is possible, however, that the destruction of an image in Palestine was the prior underlying source of John's motivation for writing his treatises for writing his treatises against Byzantine iconoclasm. During the time, during that time. Some Byzantines, some Byzantines believed that believed they had lost God's favor due to rampant idolatry and blamed themselves for the Islamic takeover. Thus, in the Byzantine Empire, empire iconoclasm became one of the measures enacted to restore the favor of God and prevent further encroachment by the Muslims in Palestine. However, it may have been an edict enabled by Yazid II in 721 that has a greater initial effect on John of Damascus. The edict of Judge II called the purging of any image in churches in the region. Every kind of pictorial representation, be it on boats or in wall mosaics or on holy vessels or altar courts or anything else 
of the sword that is found in all Christian churches should be obliterated and entirely destroyed. Not only three, not only this, but also all the effigies that are set up as decoration in the marketplaces of cities. Evidence for this purge of images in Muslim-dominated lands has recently been has recently been found in a number of 8th century churches in the area. The strange thing, the strange thing, however, is that is that often only a portion of the mosque will emerge. Robert Sick, an archaeologist studying the phenomenon, an archaeologist studying the phenomenon, believes that the evidence demonstrates that while the call for the destruction of images in the churches was probably inspired by Muslim laws prohibiting the depiction of any living being. The gentle rearrangement, rearrangement of many of the mosaic tiles seem, seems to suggest that it was the Christians themselves who desecrated the images, unlike the iconoclasts in, in Byzantium, who only destroyed sacred images, the Palestinian, re 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 the Palestinian rearrangers defect, defaced many images of animals or ordinary people which would suggest their attention to Muslim objections. Thus, John of Damascus could have been reacting to Yazid II's to Yazid second edict of 721 calling for the destruction of icons, of icons and images. Even the cross was desecrated. The Palestinian mosaics may have had only gentle defacement, but the reason for the action was directly due to the Muslims, not Leo the Third. Lut, however, maintains that John's treatises are specifically against the Byzantine form of iconoclasm. Even though John lived his whole life within a Muslim within a Muslim context, he still identified himself as a Byzantine priest, loyal to the emperor in his civil duties, though the madly opposed opposed to the emperor's usurpation of ecclesiastical matters. It is true that John's main criticism seemed to be consecrated on the Byzantine form, which attacked sacred images only and not more images of living beings. However, he was certainly aware of the type of iconoclasm taking place under the pressure of the Muslims. John's reaction could still have been initiated by the destruction he saw around him in his own country as a result of Muslim demands and the call for the destruction of Ik icons as well as the removal of the cross. Lutz also maintains that John's writings were probably not disturbed in the Byzantine Empire and therefore not well known in Byzantine before his death. However, the anathema at Hyria in AD 754 seems to counter this view and indicates that his arguments were indeed well known and cost enough of a still that he received a four-bolt anathema to Mansur or evil name Saracen at heart anathema to Mansur the image worshiper and writer of falsehoods anathema to Mansur who denied Christ uh, who denied Christ and betrayed his sovereign anathema to Mansur the teacher of abuse doctrine and the perfect and the perfecter of holy scripture anathema thus John may have targeted his study against the Byzantine Empire, but he was probably also reacting to the, lo to the local pressure for the Islamic form of iconoclasm. Manichaeanism What about heretical beliefs that seem to flourish again due to the relative freedom that they, they enjoy under the new regime? The practice of Manichaeanism, the practice of Manichaeism, for example, was largely did was was largely dead in the Byzantine Empire of the 18th century. However, the tolerance of the people of the book in the Umar Empire may have encouraged a resurgence of Manichaeism in the region. The danger of dualism. A good deity versus an evil deity was a core belief of many Manichaeans as well as was seen as a treat by Byzantine Christians.
John of Damascus may have engaged himself with the Manichaeans due to these concerns. In all, John got to work against the Manichaeans. The third section, in his heresies, and the treatise titled Dialog Dialogus contra Manichaeus, a dialogue against the Manichaeus, as well as for chapters in his Orthodox faith. Islam, therefore, play a secondary role in creating a atmosphere suitable for the rekindling of Manichaean ide ideas and practices, which John apparently thought were dangerous enough to write against. Thus, the arrangement, the, thus, the argument concerning the Trinity against the Manichaeans may have, may have actually been aimed at Islam. Luth writes, one wonders if the real intellectual context with which John is engaging here is not so much many key objections to Christianity as Muslim objections. For example, John, as John seeks to ridicule the Maniki position of the principle of beginnings, the Maniki contacts him with a question regarding the Trinity. You say that there are, there are three hypotheses, and how can you say that they must begin from a monarch? John goes on for several pages exploring how the Son and Spirit derive from the Father and yet remain one. This could have seen a way for John to teach Christians how they could defend the Trinity against the objections of Islam without confronting Islam directly. This would especially be necessary if direct criticism of Islam it believes was becoming dangerous. Luth also gives several reasons why the dialogue against the Manichees could have focused more on Islam. First, he says that the objections to the Trinity were similar and and would have fit and would have fit well with the objections of Islam. The same way Luth says that the issues discussed by John were also in the interest were also of interest to his contemporary Muslims especially the topic of confidence and creative free will, which was hardly disputed in Muslim circles under the Umayyads. The theological problems raised fit well within a Muslim context. In fact, Lut conjectures that given that these are given that these are issues that engages Muslim contemporaries in the fact that John at one point seeks to respond to the problems to respond to problems raised by the Christian doctrine of the Trinity. One might conjecture that this dialogue was indeed a rhetorical exercise composed when John was in contact with Muslims with his ears of their debates and their tongues against Christianity. This dialogue might have also been a way to present arguments against Islam and the whole without a 
one of those heresies was monophysitism, monophysitism or the belief of those who denied there, who denied there was a distinction in the two natures of Christ. This view existed before John's time and was still prevalent in Arabia in the fringe regions of the Byzantine Empire, providing a constant theological threat to Chalcedonian Christianity. Monophysites thought that Christ essentially had one composite nature, the human nature was absorbed by the divine nature. This was sometimes thought to create a new third nature or tertium quid. The monophysites argued that it was absurd to distinguish between the nature and the hypostasis because then because then there would be the possibility of nature without any concrete reality or essence without a person. However, as John explained in the incarnation, it is possible to have nature or essence distinct from the person or hypostatic because though both are necessary, there is a distinction between the kind of thing that something is and the thing itself. In other words, Jesus Christ was not a composite nature, but a composition of the two natures joined hypostatically one in one person. Thus, the incarnate Jesus is wholly divine in his divinity and wholly human in his humanity, yes, the one person in reference to the Godhead. Since Muslims did not believe in the incarnation of Christ, those arguments against the monophysites could have provided Christians with another right to understand the proper beliefs concerning Christ's incarnation. This would have allowed Christians to better refute the Islamic denial of the incarnation itself. One of the opposite sides of one of the opposite side of the spectrum was Nestorianism. The Nestorians, also known as the Church of the East, thought that Jesus Christ had two natures as well as two persons. John argued, John agreed with the Nestorians in their view of Christ's immutability in reference to his divine nature. However, in their own emphasis, in their of emphasis of this single attribute, they rejected the one hypostasis of Christ by separating his two natures in such a way that they ended up avoiding two separate persons or hypothesis as well, one divine and one human. In John the Harasibus, he writes that the Nestorians hold that God the world exists by himself and separately, and that his humanity exists by itself. And the more humble of the Lord's actions during his sojourn among us, they attribute to his humanity alone, whereas the more noble and those befitting the divinity describe to God the world alone, but they do not attribute the both to the same person. Luth writes that John argues that the failure to distinguish properly between his hypostasis and nature renders the position open to all sorts of error. John thought that the Orthodox Chalcedonian view, which was his position, put forward a middle way between the Nestorians and the Monophysites instead of Christ having two natures and two hypostases, as the Nestorian believed or composite nature, which the Jacobites favored. The Orthodox Chalcedonian formula taught that Christ had to distinct natures in one person or hypostasis. Uh, again, a proper understanding of the interaction between Christ's two natures and his one hypostasis would help Christian apologists better, de better define would help Christian apologists better define their beliefs in the face of Muslim challenges. Challenges. The ultimate concern for John in confronting these heresies was to inform Christians about the first views so that they would not be misled. He addressed the, the, these two heresies in his theological work as well as his polemic works. Whether he was speaking theologically or apologetically, his message to Christians was the same. Know what you believe, be able to defend your beliefs and be ready to confront and refute error. This admonition was true whether it was meant to in response 
in iconoclastic eros, Christological heresies, or challenges from Islam. John's apologetics flowed out of his theology and his developed his theology in order to lay a foundation for his apologetics. Therefore, since Islam was involved to opening up the theological playing field for previously sub Christological heresies, as well as an initiating iconoclastic events in Syria and also challenging the conduct doctrines of Christianity. Most, if not all, of John's writings reflected some, some type of influence from the religion that was increasingly dominating his world. Conclusion The doctrine of the Trinity is one of the uncompromising beliefs of Christianity. In John's treatment of this subject, in his Orthodox faith, he gained from the Church Fathers who had preceded him in order to produce a standard, a standard explanation of the Trinity for those who would follow. The first half of this chapter, therefore, summarizes John's explanation of the Trinity and analyzes concepts of this crucial doctrine. It is important to understand John's theological understanding of this doctrine so that his treatment of the Trinity in his apologetic works be compared. In, later, in the latter half of the chapter, John's view of the Trinity as, repre as represented in his theological work of the Spirit was compared to his defense of the Trinity against Islam in the heresy of the Ismailites and the disputation between a Christian and a Saracen not only were common themes, themes detailed but it was shown that the similar wording was also employed. The same, these same themes were also developed in John's polemical writings against non-Muslim beliefs such as Manichaeism, which was outside of Christianity as well as the Monophysites and the Nestorians, who were considered to hold the Christological heresies within Christianity. These proxy arguments may have enabled John to address the Muslim challenges while remaining under the cover of critiquing a local heresy or a general religious dispute. In addition, the overlapping themes suggest that John's, John of Damascus' apologetic interaction with Islam th Islamic <laughs> theology, as well as non-Muslim heretical views, molded the way he presented the Orthodox doctrine of the Trinity as is found in his Orthodox faith throughout this process. Both, uh, both aspects of his work seem to have developed in response to the God of Islamic theology and hegemony to counter this expansion. John Asp John's apologetic model was developed in order to support his views that Christianity was a true faith and therefore superior to Islam. Later, John's successors, especially Theodore Abu Kuro, carried his work a step further by upgrading John's apologetic approach so that Orthodox Christian theology, which had been standardized, standardized by John, could deal more specifically with the developing Islamic theology, it is now time to examine John's apologetic approach as well as the way his successors adopted and adapted this approach for their own apologetics and for their own apologetic ends.